Welcome to Gothcast, episode six. Yep. I am Dr. Sanders. This is Robbie Gore. Today we're going to tackle another pioneering band, and this time we're going to the death rock scene. Yep. Specifically, we're talking about Christian Death and Roz Williams. Super heroines. That's what mm-hmm. this was playing. Okay. But yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we're going to talk about Christian Death and, and the super heroines. Well, you know, these bands are kind of intertwined, and they're very associated in their sound. Well, uh, the super heroines pretty much lead to the formation of... Well, Eva O is the, the, the linking connection between those two. And while she, she did have involvement, especially with Roz Williams, you know, the Shadow Project and everything like that later on, on Only Theater of Pain, she does backing vocals, and I think she helped with the writing, and she even helped with some of the later Christian Death things. So... It's yeah. kind of a good link for us. And then one of the other reasons is that we tend to do about about four albums every single podcast. and Seems to be a good, nice, happy medium. Yeah, because with Roz Williams, basically the, the albums that we're going to talk about with Christian Death today are going to be Roz Williams albums with Christian Death. So yep. it's going to be Only Theater of Pain, Catastrophe Ballet. Uh, Catastrophe Ballet. Yeah, I know. It's kind of a, I don't know why I feel <laughs> saying that. And it's going to be Ashes. Yep. And so those are the three albums that they did with Roz Williams. Before they switched to Valerie. Yeah. yeah. And then with the superhero ones, we're just kind of talk about some songs we like. We're probably going to go in depth on most of these albums later because we're probably going to have an Eva O. We'll probably episode. briefly mention which albums and, you know, yeah. are important. And um, but we kind of just wanted to have a, like four segments with this one. And we thought the superhero ones was kind of a good introduction because most people... I don't think are as familiar with the superheroines as they are Christian Death. Yeah, actually, I don't think a lot of people really even know who the superheroines are, sadly. Yeah, which is kind of a disappointment. But we thought that this would be kind of a good way to slightly introduce everybody to Eva O's work and superheroines while not kind of dedicating a podcast to it and maybe kind of getting into that later. Yeah. Because that is kind of its own sort of thing. Potentially opening up the book for us to talk about it more in depth in the future. Yeah. We just didn't want to kind of jump into that one if most people aren't familiar with it. Yeah. We figured Christian Death was a little more appropriate to get to first. Even though chronologically speaking, superheroines does happen before Christian Death. Just for the sake of relevance, we decided that we would talk about Christian Death first in more depth. Okay. So starting off, let's Kind of get into the super heroines now. All right. This is one of the bands that influenced death rock, definitely in terms of sound. and Definitely a little bit style-like. I mean, oh, yeah. It's I mean, not as heavily as Christian Death, but they yeah. kind of started to pioneer the whole, at least the makeup look for death rock. Yeah. And the album covers and yeah. stuff. So this is kind of an interesting episode, at least, and that's the first time that we're talking about a band from America. So... Death Rock was really kind of influenced by sort of the L.A. scene out there and that that sort of punk. Very influenced by hardcore punk of the 80s. Yeah. So we had, you know, Sisters of Mercy, we did The Cure, we did Bauhaus. Which are all very post-punk influenced. Yeah. Which is funny because Death Rock is actually much more directly influenced by punk itself. Yeah. And I think a lot of those bands have a lot of influence from uh, like glam rock. Yeah. And, you know, kind of David Bowie influenced Mm -hmm. and things like that. Whereas Death Rock is definitely more influenced by that kind of L.A. leather scene, you know, like yep. the studs and everything. and they Lots kinda, of gain on their guitars. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it's a very, very different sound. And it's a lot more abrasive. Kind of stuff that really does scare your parents. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, I would say that. And definitely because it comes from punk, a lot of these bands tend to be less mopey and more angry yeah they're more overtly aggressive i would say yeah and and that's in terms of lyrical they tend to be more controversial in their lyrics they tend to use a lot more swear words or it's like you cut me i cut you you know i mean even we're gonna get into only theater of pain but i'll mention some of that profanity and things like that on there um not that we have any we don't have any issue with that i want to make that clear yeah (laughs) we are doing a whole episode dedicated to christian death but yeah this the kind of death rock was way more abrasive and that's one of the things i want to mention before this if you're not into death rock and say you're you're a cure listener you know or you're sisters of mercy listener yeah you're really into Bauhaus and that kind of like really well mixed kind of big sound or maybe like very dark wavy kind of stuff yeah Yeah. this might not be your cup of tea and i would say you need to kind of be 
open to what this is. You know, it's yeah. it's you gotta kind of expect a punk sort of sound. You know, it yeah. may not be mixed with or EQ'd perfectly or anything like that. The Damned almost might be a nice introductory band because yeah. they kind of touch both genres, really. Yeah, the Damned are actually a, a pretty good crossing point for that, especially since Slater. You know, they yeah. they actually did cross over to a whole bunch of different yep. kinds of genres. But so just be aware when you're listening to these albums if you've never listened to them before. It's going to sound sort of like a punk album mixed with sort of like the book Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way I'll explain it. So getting in Super Heroines. Now, this band is so awesome, and they, I think, are really underrated, unfortunately. No, they're actually they're one of my favorite. I would say my favorite death rock band, to be honest really? with you. Yeah. yeah. Man, they're competing with that All Gone Dead album yeah. for me. But, yeah. So, yeah, they are so so good formed during the early 1980s in la mm-hmm. yeah and this was definitely one of the crossovers from almost directly like their first album it has a huge huge punk influence yeah and then is, later they went kind of more romantic and sort of yeah yeah at least in terms of lyrics they're definitely not in terms of sound no, they yeah they definitely had the, a very aggressive sound all the way through and the key person here is going to be eva O. Oh, she was she's gonna play a big role in the scene as time goes on yeah i mean she's gonna do super heroin she has even her own solo albums she's in christian death for only theater of pain or she contributed to the album and then she yeah. played with the band actually she's in shadow project i think she probably did something else but i can't remember what it is but she just is really really influential to a lot of people and this band was extremely influential to a lot of different bands but doesn't get a ton of credit yeah i know like all their members go on to join other major bands i mean mazzy star and and hole yep um so yeah, Jill mazzy star and hole and then darrow goes on to play with the pre guns and roses band that featured izzy straddling yeah, hollywood and rose axel rose yeah uh, yeah <laughs> that's weird right <laughs> that's it's i don't know well that's the kind of thing is there's so much rock and roll and sort of stuff around the time and because these band, these people were in America and they're yeah. part of a scene, you know, especially like, in LA. Yeah, they can kind of link up with other bands. So that's why I think a lot of these members wanted to do other stuff. But let's just kind of get into some of the albums. So it's going to be 1982, Cry for Help. Yep. This album is great. <laughs> oh, I love this album. Uh, I have this one on vinyl and it's just such a good album. There's so much raw energy on the album and Eva O brings this great presence to the music. Yeah, it's kind of strange because her voice is is very unique yeah and it almost sound and don't kill me if anybody's <laughs> listening to this i swear it sounds like a dude sometimes <laughs> I, I don't mean that in like a, in a negative way at all yeah i just think that the way that she sings because she goes because she'll do these things where she sings she's like da, 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 da. you know she she definitely has a lower register voice and the, she takes advantage of that yeah. which i think is really cool because Especially when you listen to different albums between them. Yeah. Her voice is very distinct and it almost sounds like two different singers. Yep. Which I think is really cool. Another thing that I really appreciate about the Super Heroines, I mean, they do it on Cry for Help and they do it on their other albums as well. Mm-hmm. But they do a lot of interesting production things with the albums, like including children talking and reciting. Yeah. Like, Things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's something we're definitely going to see with Christian Death. Yeah, too. yeah. It's going to be a big influence for them. Pretty much every single Christian Death album has a soundscape yep. sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, this is definitely where it starts. But I'm just going to list off a few songs I really like from this album. So it's going to be Black Wedding. Blue Blood's really good. And then, um, of course, I really like Cry for Help. The Beast is probably one of the most popular ones, probably because it's the opener. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, everything on here is really good. It kind of has... In terms of production and things like that, sort of this tinny sound. Yeah, well, and this again comes from the whole hardcore punk scene. Yeah. Is that they're very DIY and they're not into big production value and they pretty much, you know, they grab whatever guitar amp they have and they record yeah. it, you know, just mm-hmm. kind of as best they can. Yeah. And that leaves you with the sound that's not always super full. It's not a very mid-rangey yeah. kind of guitar sound that we're used to. Mm-hmm. It's a very dry, harsh sounding guitar. I would actually say if you're um into in the flat field, <laughs> yeah. If you prefer that album as opposed to say some of the other cleaner albums, yeah. 
And this would be like right up your alley. Yeah. It's a lot like that, but less avant garde, I would say. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It is. That's, a good, that's actually a really good way. I guess I didn't think about that, but that's a really good way to put it is this album is very straightforward. Yeah. You know, each song kind of just stands on its own. And it is like very much like a punk album, you know. In the Five Field is, I don't want to say this, but it's almost like a concept album in the way that it's done. It, it is, and I think it was intentional. Yeah, whereas these albums, I don't really see that way. No, I think I think they write a whole bunch of songs, they put them onto an album, and they put you know whichever sound whatever sounds right onto it. Yeah, and that that's not anything to detract from this. It's just the way that a lot of kind of punk bands would do it, and yeah. because Death Rock does come from a punk background, that's. You know, it's not surprising. Yeah. I see why this album gets grouped in with punk a lot more. Yeah. Unfortunately. It definitely sounds a lot more like punk, and I could see why a lot of goth people might not be super familiar with this band. Yeah. Is because they don't really fit the standard for gothic music exactly. Yeah. Especially in their sound. Yeah. Um, their image definitely helps shape how gothic music will look and yeah. death rock moving forward and a lot of things that will happen yeah. in the gothic scene. Yeah. Well, I think with the next album especially, like, yeah, this has dark themes, you yeah. know, like Black Wedding and things like that. It has that sort of lyrical tinge to it where yep. it kind of pushes over to the edge of it being influential in death rock. Yeah. But I know a lot more people who group this in as a punk album. They're like, oh, Super Heroines is a punk band. Yeah. And they just listen to Cry for Help. And, you know, you don't really get in the big death rock tinge until Souls That Save. And that's where a lot of people say, okay, like this, you know, especially with the whole album cover and everything, the people are like, yeah, this people will accept that much more as like, oh, this is a, a gothic rock album or like, or death rock death album. Rock. Yeah, the death where, rock album. Yeah. <laughs> So, but Souls of Save, so we, like I said, we're kind of going through these ones a little bit faster just because um, when we get to Christian Death, that's the main point of the episode. Yeah. Believe me, we're going to have our own Evo O thing. Yeah. Like, this guy just to satiate everybody's thirst for super heroin stock. But yeah, Souls of Save, I like to sound a lot better. Yeah. Well, it's definitely, mm. uh, I mean, they step up their production quality, their concepts for the albums are getting yeah. bigger, more refined. Kind of get that echoey drum sound. Yep. I kind of like that and sort of. They still have that really teeny guitar, and that's some yeah. just, just, just that that's a thing. That's you know, it is their thing, and that yeah. crosses kind of over into Christian Death too. Exactly. Like, oh yeah, 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 it does when we get to that. Yeah, but yeah, I I like this album a lot, and I'm actually really happy that they reissued it recently. Yeah, so I can actually get my hands on a copy of it because I know that people really hold on to that one. Yep, at least good good quality copies of that one because usually whenever you get them, they're all beat up and a beer spill on them or whatever <laughs> yeah and well that's what's actually nice about reissue albums a lot of people don't want to touch them i just kind of want to briefly touch on the fact that a lot of reissue albums are actually really good and you know it's great to own originals when you get your hands on them but if you get a pressing of an album that sounds great and is not going to break your bank account then yeah. do it well good thing about these ones too is they're usually set a little bit cheaper just because the run times are a little lower yep um, I really like that. But on this album, favorite song, Strip to My Love. That yeah. song, so good. That almost is just like worth it to buy the album. And it so. is hard for me to pick out songs for these albums just because I don't know, I'm just a big super heroines fan in general. Yeah. So like I actually genuinely like listening to these albums yeah. from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boneyard Sky. Yep. I got to call those. So those are, those are my two favorite songs on this album, I just want to say. But then the album art, so cool. It's a classic look. I think it's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it was necessarily super influential to the way that they did their album art or anything like that, but if you ever seen the the logos for Super Heroines, yeah. they look like the Christian Death ones, you they know? They do, and I think yeah, like the it's souls, no coincidence. <laughs> yeah, like the Souls That Save one, it looks like the Christian Death logo font, yeah. and then it looks, kind of like, looks like handwritten. Like I've seen the vinyl record, and yep. it looks like handwritten. It looks like only Theater of Pain. Kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, I always thought that was kind of weird yeah <laughs> but that's cool <laughs> I, I just think that this is that was overall just a, a better album for me yeah i think this album is more of a death rock album and it's more of a gothic rock album yeah and i i like both of them yeah. cry for help for me has more nostalgic value yeah just because i came from a background where i was already listening to punk rock before i was ever really mm -hmm. listening to goth music yeah and super heroines was like this band that was just like oh yes like oh this mm -hmm. is so different than like the rest of la hardcore yeah. and yeah okay i could see that yeah but then that album i really wanted to talk about 
which is going to be Love and Pain. Yep. Now, <laughs> for me, this is my favorite superheroines record. I just thought it had a much better kind of overall composition and the songs I thought were were really good. Yeah. Now this album it's really confusing. Okay. Now the first two albums released in 1982 mm-hmm. and 1983. So Cry for Albums 1982, 1983 is Souls That Save. Yep. Now Love and Pain was <laughs> officially released <laughs> in 1983, but it was yeah. recorded yeah. in the 80s when they were still a band. Yep. I want to make that clear because I know if people are looking at today. Yeah, that's if you're re- looking at the discography on Wikipedia, you're going to see uh, 1982, 1983, 1993. And you're and like, all, oh, all the CD printings it, of yeah. it are say that, you yeah. know. And this album was recorded before that. It was recorded like eight years prior. Yeah. Um, and then released later. But this album I actually think is great. Maybe that's because it had some time to kind of sit or something, you know. Maybe no, I-, I agree with you. Well, see, I think that while Souls That Save steps up its production value and it's more gothic and it's more death rock, I like personally Cry For Help more. But I, Love and Pain is also, I would say, tied for my other favorite album yeah. by them. It, it seems to be a pattern for me. I, I don't know. For whatever reason, middle albums always seem to suffer a little bit, at least in my review of them. <laughs> so disappointing. No, the other album's great. And I can't say a lot of bad things about it. I just, I like Cry for Help and I like this album a lot more than I mm-hmm. like Souls That Save, personally. Okay, yeah. So for Love and Pain, I, I tend to like a lot more of the songs on here than I did the other ones, at least consistently. Yeah. If that makes sense. Not saying the other ones are bad. You know, I said... I really like those albums, but I just tend to like the sound of this one a little more. And it does have that punk production, but the songs I think are just really good. So just starting off, you have Children of Light, you have Apathy, you have Generation of Hypocrites, and yep. you actually have like a re-recording of Black Wedding. <laughs> I don't know why that's there really to be honest I, with you. <laughs> I don't know. It's like slightly different. I I'm I think. I mean, it's, it yeah. starts differently. But then you also have a few live tracks at the end. I'm not sure why those were added. Maybe they didn't have time to record them. Well, I but, mean, the official release date for this is 1993, so I'm sure there's things that were added in here yeah. that weren't necessarily intentionally planned on being on the album. Yeah. I actually like the sound of the, the live songs on here. So yeah. And you have Death on the Elevator is my favorite for that one. I will say that's something that I think death rock bands benefit from, and mm-hmm. especially super heroines, yeah. is that... The LA hardcore bands really knew how to put on a show live. Yeah. And Super Heroines definitely does. That is kind of one of the issues, is especially with punk bands. I tend to like the live albums a lot more mm-hmm. than the, I like the studio albums. And it's usually because the energy will come across. Yeah. Well, so on a studio album from a punk band, you might not have a lot of production value to go mm-hmm. off of. But you also then are confronted with the fact that you're working within a confined space. Mm-hmm. You can't just run around and do whatever the hell yeah. you want and yeah so there's not going to be as much raw energy that comes across and you, there's things you do to make up for that and you yeah. can try and get the energy across but it's never quite the same as watching a live punk show yeah well it, one example i can throw out there i know it's gonna be a weird one because i don't listen to like a ton of punk music that's not really like, yeah. my thing for the most part um but the band no effects yeah. So, I yeah, right? So, that's why I said it's going to be a weird one. Is I have, like, never been able to listen to, like, a NoFX album, like, all the way through, right? Yeah. No offense to them. It's just not my thing. It's not I, my thing either. Well, like, for me, I'm much more, like, 80s and 70s punk. Exactly, right? <laughs> but if there was going to be an album I listened to by them, yeah, and it's, like, say at work, like, somebody just, like, is like, oh, I want to listen to some punk music. It's like... I'll throw on their their live album called I Heard They Suck Live. Yeah. And that's like the only album I can listen to by them. And, <laughs> and like, because it just has like such an energy in the other albums. I'm just like, ugh, like, no. <laughs> no, but, I totally get that. Man. Um, and just having gone to punk shows, I remember being dragged to see shows for bands that I was not particularly excited to go see and yeah. watching them play and be like, oh, that was a great show. Yeah. One of the things I I really did want to talk about with this particular band and Eva O, I don't know how she feels about this today and it's a very weird subject. Yeah. You think you think you know what I'm gonna talk about? Uh I don't know. Uh, I, I feel like I never really know with you. You might Donnie. not you might not know this one. Is um 
Yeah, so the song Night Stalker by Super Heroines. Yeah. No. She yeah. went out with Richard Ramirez. Yep. Who is the serial killer. Yep. So Eva O had dated him and then apparently had written the song about him, or at least it's believed that the song was written about him, you know. Well. Because I think he was called the Night Stalker. Yeah. And <laughs> Yeah, that's a it's a really, really, really good song. It is. It is. It's like one of the best songs. But it has that kind of story to it. Yeah. And it just is like, whoa, like that's crazy. Well that, I think that's almost the kind of the whole formation of the death rock thing is it's so you've got punk and then all of a sudden they're being really influenced by gothic fashion, so they're dressing that way. Yeah. But then you have these really controversial lyrics that are almost like too controversial for punk, really, even yeah. at the time. Well, a lot of them went... It's interesting because a lot of them would criticize like Christianity or religion like that. Yeah. But not every band, of course, I'm saying, you know, like this is a very general well, thing. Well, and a lot of saying this, is, stuff is satirical and yeah, but like, some of these people were extremely interested in like Satanism yeah. and, and things like the that. Occult and, yeah. And th- that was a huge part of why a lot of these bands have those kind of lyrics. Yep. And, and it's kind of strange. Not every band was like that, but super heroines, you know, Evo got really into Satanism and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that because of the r- r- sort of religious, kind of connotation to yep. a lot of these songs and a lot of these bands really early on it kind of carried over into today even you know new death rock bands definitely they will often go for the kind of religious point of view mm-hmm. or i think that even more so than say some somebody who's taking from Bauhaus or something yeah exactly i also think that that's kind of what would later contribute to kind of the merging of goth and metal is the fellow themes of the occult and things of that nature yeah yeah Kind of like that doom metal-y sort of sound stuff. Yeah. Uh, or even that kind of symphonic-y metal stuff. I'm not really into that stuff, but I think a lot of that kind of takes influence from that. Yeah, that definitely. Too, that sort of religious sort of thing, or at least a very heavy emphasis on it. Mm-hmm. So that's... When Norwegian black metal would definitely steal the goths' like, <laughs> style of makeup. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that that is true. I don't know. Because I don't know that much about any of that stuff so maybe maybe they were pretty sure they did maybe they cohabitated (laughs) i don't know but (laughs) maybe we'll do an episode on norwegian black metal but let's not i don't think i don't think we will but if you're into that then that's cool we're sorry we we don't hate you yeah just your music we just (laughs) it's just not my not my thing um no we're just kidding (laughs) yeah was that pretty much wraps up super heroines i think their last album was probably their best at least for me Probably yours is Cry for Help. Yeah, uh, my favorite is Cry for Help. Last album's definitely second favorite, and second album's good, but for me, it's not as good as the other two, personally. But yeah, that pretty much wraps up Super Heroines, at least for today. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that we can get into with Eva O and what comes after Super Heroines. Yeah. Uh, we just kind of wanted to go over Super Heroines just because it's a good introduction to Christian Death, even if Eva O wasn't super involved with Christian Death. Yeah. It's kind of a good section for yeah. that. And then... so and She definitely plays a role with the first album. Yeah. So it's a nice segue. Yeah. So if you get a chance to listen to Super Heroines, we recommend it. I highly recommend you check them out. Yeah. So on to Christian Death. All right. Let's do this. Moving on to... Only Theater of Pain. Now, <laughs> now Christian Death is one of those bands that the first album is by far the most popular. Oh, yeah. And it's... A very interesting thing to talk about, and I thought Christian Death would be an interesting topic to discuss, not only for their music, but for the kind of dynamic in that band, yeah. because today, Christian Death is still touring, right? They just came out mm-hmm. with a new album this year. It's in 2015, the Root of All Evolution, a Root of Evolution, <laughs> yeah. I, um, something like that title. Um, the Evolution is definitely in the title. <laughs> um, you know, standard Christian Death album. I've listened to it about twice and you know it's okay i'll get my opinions on that later if i need to (laughs) but christian death is definitely one of those bands that a lot of people will just listen to say like the first two albums and then maybe a few other songs here and there yep but people definitely favor the Roz williams period yeah but what's interesting is that Roz williams is only on three albums i know i mean 19 you know 1985 is when he's not in the band anymore exactly so you have your three albums right you're only theater pain you catastrophe about catastrophe ballet why can't i never say that (laughs) and ashes yep and that's it. That's the only Roz Williams albums. And of course, we have like some live stuff and that was released later and a few like little compilation things. Yeah. But those are the three albums that are with Roz Williams. And then there's tons of albums without him yeah, with Ballard Canned as a singer. 
and there's so many more albums yeah <laughs> and they still come out consistently and i think that that is a really strange dynamic for this band because apparently you know they had had some hits later yeah with the valor candera and with him singing and everything like that and those c- albums are not the favorite albums of people you know no the only theater pain well, there are definitely there are different different kind of vibe from the ross williams albums yeah I feel like. and i think that a lot of people turn off by the somewhat political nature of some of the Valakan era. Yeah. But we can talk about all that as we're going on. And um, mm-hmm. if, if we ever do a Christian Death Continued yep. era sort of thing, we, we might do that. I don't... If there's a demand for it, I know that a lot of people aren't really into that era as much. Yeah. Um, but if it you know people really want that, we can do a Christian Death Part 2. But for this one, we're going to focus on the first three albums, which are Roz Williams' yep. albums. So Only Theater Pain... Is by far the most popular. Definitely, it's the one you see in every record store. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's constantly being reprinted. Yeah, and they just um, they remastered it, and they have like the new cover and everything. Like the new covers, like beige and everything. Yep, it's always on white vinyl now. Yeah, yeah. it's very very available. It's actually a pretty cheap record if you come across it. Yeah, I th- I think I picked a brand new pressing up for I don't know, like eighteen seventy dollars. Yeah, like that. it's not bad. Yeah, and so this is a pretty freaking good album definitely like i said with super heroines you need to kind of be aware of what type of music this is if you're not into abrasive music you're not gonna like this album oh definitely not well the way i kind of look at this is this for me feels almost like a transition from the super heroines into christian death this album this album feels very super heroines to me except you're lacking Evo and you got Roz Williams and yeah, which is strange because you know, Evo on the album, the only thing she really contributes as far as, you know, like actually 100% contributes to the album, if that yeah. makes sense is, is in credit for it is the, I think the production and backing vocals. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, all the band members are pretty involved with the way that they had made this album. Yeah. It does bear a striking resemblance to superhero when sound. It does. And that's in terms of guitar, in terms of drums, in terms of, not necessarily vocal delivery. Yeah, not vocal delivery at all, I would feel like. Yeah, Roz Williams on this album. It's a very unique vocal style. Yeah, it's almost like talk singing mm-hmm. in a way. And it's almost like sort of poetry in yeah. a way. He's almost like talking through the songs. Well, and Eva O would experiment a little bit with that on some of the albums, mm-hmm. but not to the extent that Roz Williams does. Yeah, for this album, you you have really kind of like a... And then he went down to the house, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. And that's it's pretty signature. Yeah, it's it's pretty unique. Mm-hmm. And he has a very distinct voice, which is probably what most people attach themselves to and what makes this band kind of not forgettable is the guitar sound, the way everything's produced and then Roz Williams' voice on top of it all. Yep. Because honestly, while a lot of the songs have a catchy melody here and there, the majority of the songs are more straightforward and kind of just driving songs. Yeah. So Roz's voice gives it a, a unique kind of sound. Well, I think that's kind of what helps define death rock in the beginning. Is it so super heroines are more blatantly punk than yeah. Christian death is Christian death sounds a lot like super heroines, at least in terms of the band, the guitar sound very similar. Mm-hmm. It's mixed in a similar kind of way. And then you have Roz Williams' presence, which really kind of brings this different dynamic to the band. Yeah. And, of course, the most popular song. I actually, you know, I tend not to agree with what's the most popular song on the album being my favorite on the album. Yeah. Uh, pretty much every single time we've done that. You know, <laughs> like, when we did Disintegration, we said neither one of us really, like, love song. And when we did... Yeah. <sighs> what was the other one? There's good reason for that. Yeah, when we did 70 <laughs> Seconds, I said, like, the, A Force is not my favorite song. But, so... <laughs> But Only Theater Pain, Romeo's Distress is by far my favorite song on this album because it's just such a unique song. But of course, the biggest issue you're going to have with this album is the lyrical content. If you are not ready for some controversial lyrics, yeah, it's, uh, do not listen to this album. It's like, a hard-hitting album in that respect. Although I'd be kind of surprised if you were listening to a podcast and, and you wouldn't listen to you know, yeah, kind of that stuff. Say if you're just getting into goth now, maybe you should put off Christian death for a little while. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, if you're just kind of getting into that sort of talking about religion, talking about race issues, but in the beginning of the song "Romeo's Distress," which is their most popular song, a lot of people tend to kind of glance over lyrics of things like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, uh, but the M word <laughs> is right in the beginning. It says "burning a cross on a 
M word lawn <laughs> and talking about the KKK and this is, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a little out there and a lot of people will think that that's very racist, but I tried to look up as much information as I could about that in particular, you know, about how they kind of took religion and they talk about religion and talk about race issues. And yeah. apparently Roz Williams parents were super religious and kind of involved in the KKK or were very racist. Yeah. It's kind of unconfirmed, but that's kind of a belief. Mm -hmm. So I could see how he would feel he needs to talk about that, especially if, you know, Russ Williams is very emotional and really really expresses himself through this. Yeah, definitely. And I think that the song, yeah, it maybe doesn't need that particular set of words. I mean, I guess it would be a good song anyway, Yeah, but I don't think it really detracts from it. No, not at all. I would say it kind of reminds me, uh, if we briefly depart from the uh, the gothic scene, yeah. to talk about X, yeah. they released Johnny Hit and Run Pauline. Yeah. You have all these lyrics there about rape, and it almost became an anthem for all these like jock punk guys who were like, yeah, go rape. Like, yeah. And then bands like, no, this is a criticism of culture yeah. and the way we treat women and... Mm -hmm. I feel like it's kind of a similar thing with this band. I think a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, like uh, Satanism and uh, yeah. Yeah, like kill blacks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that, where it's it's more trying to say something about how it's wrong. Yeah. And I think a lot of people misconstrue that. You know, a lot of people just unfortunately latch onto a word or, you know, something like that. And they're like, well, this must represent this, you know, yeah. because it has this word and that's what people say whenever they are hateful. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's the point of this or Christian death at all. Other songs that I really like from this album are figurative theater and then burnt offerings, which I think have great baseline. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> it's kind of weird to say that. I think my favorite thing on this album is the bass, which is kind of weird just because the, I kind of agree with you on that. Yeah. Um, because it starts off a lot of the songs. And I just like the way that the band comes in and just kind of that droning, go, 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 you know, sort of thing. Yeah. No, I get you. And the guitar is... I was holding off on saying something about it. <sighs> yeah. And this is coming from someone who likes super heroines a lot, mm -hmm. and I like yeah. their sound. I just kind of feel like the guitars on this album are lacking a little bit. Yeah, but... <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm trying to choose my words wisely here because it's Christian death, but I think that the guitars are obviously not the main point of the band. It's, yeah. it's kind of hard to not focus on them because it this is basically a drum bass guitar band. I mean, there yeah. are keyboards and stuff on it, but that's not really the... They're kind of sparse compared to the rest of the material. Yeah. So the guitars are very, very tinny, very trebly sound. You know, it has almost no mid or low range. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of is a, almost a little bit ear grating. I'm sorry. Kind of starts that whole... Uh super scooped mids sound yeah for <laughs> and if you don't know production or anything that just means it's kind of tinny sounding it's very um think like norwegian black metal <laughs> <laughs> you're in the norwegian black metal but but yeah i i just that's kind of my only complaint about this album because i do like the production of this album you know i like yeah i like it it's a very unique sound you know it didn't go for the big anthony kind of big sound that was in that's why i like about the the death rock sound is yeah. that you can have this very strangely eq'd stuff and yeah, it I, sounds I right because that's sort of like they're like yeah it's all about the energy and everything but is actually breaking it down and reviewing what i like and dislike about the album probably the only thing i dislike about this album is the guitars because i just want a little bit more of a punch it's not it, even necessarily it's hard to talk about these things without talking about production things that you and i are used to talking about yeah i know right <laughs> I just wish the guitars had a little more body to them, let's say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's really hard to describe it. But if you listen to the album and you say listen to, um, I don't even know, say something like, I'm trying to think of like a really good band that we would listen to. I was going to say Sam Hain, but then it has like kind of similar EQing. Well, you listen to Sam Hain. I mean, I listen, I listen <laughs> to Sam Hain. I like Sam Hain. I just listen to some like Bauhaus or something. I don't know. Some something to compare to that isn't in a death rock and just kind of hear how the guitars are maybe pushed forward a little more. Yeah. That's the best way I can honestly explain it without kind of going into it further. I'd briefly to mention, so let's take the cure, for example. Okay. Of course. Uh, yeah, I know it's hard <laughs> not to, <laughs> but there is definitely their guitars are much 
even when they're jangly and thinner sounding, mm-hmm. they have a bigger presence on the songs. Yeah. And when they go for distorted guitar sounds, they're not very thin sounding. They're very full sounding guitars. Yeah. Uh, lots of mid range presence, especially lower mids. Just kind of gives it that bigger feeling. Yeah. That, that's really my only complaint. And as far as the, the songs are actually mixed, I think they're good. Just specifically the guitar. Yeah. And I do like that the vocals are pushed pretty far in this, so you can really hear them. And I think it's important with Roz Williams' vocal delivery that his vocals are pushed forward in the mix because it really allows for you to hear his kind of poetic attitude as he's singing these songs. It is a little bit strange to me sometimes that this is by far their most popular album. Yeah, I will um, get into why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it might be, I don't know, maybe availability or something like that. The, these songs are great, and it does have a classic sound, but as compared to what would come later, I am almost more surprised that people don't latch on to the later releases. Just yeah. because the later releases, even with Roz Williams, even the next, with Roz Williams, the next like, two albums, they're a little bit more accessible. Yeah. Um, and even the Valor records, I think, are a lot of them, I don't know. Yeah, but people have, yeah, that's yeah. a whole different story. <laughs> So that's only theater pain. It's a total classic. For what it is, it's absolutely fantastic. For what they were going for, I think it encapsulates that kind of idea really well. Definitely. And a ton of bands are influenced by this sound. And like that that kind of big echoey drums and like kind of reverby vocals. Yeah, I and agree. So I just the only thing I find funny about this band is that I think that they actually played a big role in influencing metal as a and punk rock as opposed to necessarily goth music directly. Hmm. Um, just because even looking at the album art, the way like things are written, like mm-hmm. logos, immediately reminds me of bands like Cannibal Corpse and things like oh, that. Yeah, I can see that. I'm I'm not super familiar with that sort of thing, but I'm not either. But I'm at least aware of it, and I mm-hmm. pay attention to the fact that I don't know. I see similarities between the two. Huh. Yeah, not in this episode, but no. Maybe next one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's only theater pain. All right, so this is our news segment for Gothcast this episode. Yeah, and so we thought we'd do... I mean, the news segments are always kind of random with whatever we kind of want to talk about or that's recent, it seems like. It's kind of the fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> so we thought we'd talk about some movies and uh, some of the shows in particular. So I'll let Robert take it from here, and then uh, we'll probably go to the next part of that. All right. Um, so I just kind of want to briefly mention... Well, maybe not so briefly. I'm sure a lot of our fan base... Maybe you do or don't, but American Horror Story is very popular. Seems and like I know, a lot of our fans like it. Yeah. And so if you've been following you know, the series for a while now, you, I'm sure, are aware that there's a new season out called American Horror Story Hotel. This season in particular focuses on vampires. So you know, timely with a Halloween release. But I just kind of wanted to talk about the choice of music that they're using for this particular season. Surprising. Yeah. Well, for one thing... Music has become a big part of television right now. A lot of TV series are popularizing bands that have not been famous for long periods of time and bringing songs back into the mainstream. And this season of American Horror Story, they've chosen to go with a gothic theme for the soundtrack. And so far, just in the first two episodes, we've seen Sisters Mercy, we've seen The House, and we've seen... Susie and the Banshees, which I was actually really surprised with. I mean, of course, they had She Wants Revenge in there, which I kind of expected if they were going to use a gothic theme soundtrack for American Horror Story. But I I was really, you know, surprised and actually excited that they decided to use all those bands that I mentioned. Because for me, this represents the fact that not because we've seen that gothic fashion is really kind of coming back right now yeah but this i feel like really represents the return of gothic music to popular culture yeah i would agree with that especially with how popular that show is i mean people who would not be interested in vampires freak shows any of that kind of stuff you hear them say oh my gosh did you see the new american horror story yep. you know and not to necessarily attack hipsters or anyone in my family but there's somebody <laughs> in my family who's i would say is very hipster kind of you know into that whole like folky kind of stuff yeah and like would never watch anything that's like gothic she's like oh my gosh this is so ridiculous and it's like oh my gosh american horror story is is on like this is crazy and so yeah it seems like everybody loves that show and 
another you know, Lady Gaga is one of the stars of the new season, and the fact that Lady Gaga is basically promoting gothic music and gothic culture, I think, is a big indicator of a revival of gothic subculture and music yeah. in popular society. Yeah. So uh, if you haven't checked out the new season, you know I don't know where you stand on American Horror Story. I would watch it just... I've been following it just because I've been following it since the show started. Mm -hmm. But the fashion this season is very interesting and the music is very interesting. I haven't really made up my mind how I feel about the the plot so far. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's something worth checking out. Yeah. All right. Then we're just going to briefly talk about some movies and stuff. One thing that we did see, and I know we mentioned it, that we were going to go see it on one of the previous podcasts, is we did go see Hotel Transylvania 2. Yep. And I just want to say, you know, I actually surprisingly enjoyed it yeah like i said i'm a supporter of those movies because i think it's good to incorporate darker not necessarily darker but you know yeah alternative kinds of characters into kids movies to mm -hmm. get them you know more accepting of that kind of thing and to show that people who wear black aren't necessarily bad guys and all stuff i think it's kind of the first time we've seen one of these movies in a while since like either a tim burton directed movie or something like the adams family like yeah where those they make the characters likable yeah so. This is cool, and they actually bring the characters to California, mm -hmm. which is hilarious to me because, <laughs> you know, we live... In in not only California, but the most hippie part of Santa California. Cruz. Yeah. Santa Cruz. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, I, like, really enjoyed that particular part because it's so much our life. Like, yep. It's just like... Uh, it really reminded me of of what it's like for us when we walk around in all black and you see, like, people wearing all white, you know, everywhere, and they're like, oh, my goodness, you yeah. know, like... You're so alternative. You know? What what I really enjoyed about this movie is it really reflects kind of the way gothic subculture has made its way back into pop culture mm. and the way people have become accepting of it currently. Yeah. I don't want to give away too much about the movie, but obviously you have monsters and they've basically become celebrities amongst people who are not monsters, which yeah. is strange for you know these Transylvania monsters. They're yeah. used to being outcasts of society and all of a sudden they're embraced and they're on the big screen and people want to see them yeah. and that's how I kind of feel like things are going for darker themes right now dark themes are very in right now they're watched by people who don't necessarily wear all black or listen to yeah. gothic bands and well as a good segue to that you know who else we're going to be seeing on screen it's a monster <laughs> it's going to be a new Frankenstein so it's going to be called Victor Frankenstein yep and it's gonna star some guy and Daniel Radcliffe. Yep. I know. Uh, <laughs> I just uh, I'm a big fan of the Harry Potter series. So, <laughs> so I I know a lot of our fans are fans of Harry Potter, right? You know. Uh huh. Somebody back me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this movie. You know, I I was really disappointed by I Frankenstein, and I was also really disappointed by Dracula Untold. Yeah. I Frankenstein was bad. Dracula I Frankenstein was definitely worse than dracula untold oh yeah well <laughs> yeah yeah it's true. it, it is because <laughs> dracula untold was just kind of boring it didn't really do anything yeah. different it was too serious like yep. it was just way way taking itself far too seriously and i frankenstein was just freaking weird yeah movie things with angels and yeah demons and it was yeah hansel and gretel that hansel and gretel demon hunt witch hunters one was like better than yeah. both of those which is sad because <laughs> you have these very famous kinds of characters but victor frank sense coming out and we watch the trailers it was basically us just talking about upcoming movies and yeah. what we think is gonna happen this movie looks seriously like frankenstein combined with the robert downey jr sherlock holmes movies yeah they're definitely paying homage to the writing style that they use for uh robert downey jr in all of his movies <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's there's a whole bunch of one liners at the trailer, and it looks like they're gonna try and blend that sort of action, comedy, science fiction, steampunk kind of thing. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, I'm pretty excited for it to some extent because it's been a while since there's been a Frankenstein movie that I actually saw the trailer for and actually wanted to go out and see. Yeah, because <laughs> well, here's the thing: is that they've been trying to reboot the Universal horror movies for a while. Yep. And they've been unsuccessful with that, obviously. And they said that Dracula Untold was going to be it, but then now they're saying, no, it's not. It's not that wasn't the first reboot or whatever. Yep. They kind of retracted that. And if this is popular, I mean, heck, it would be cool to see some actually like humor injected in these things. Yeah. And, you know, because I've seen Frankenstein done a million times. Yeah. You know, I've seen the original Frankenstein. I've seen all the, you know, the original ones like 
the son of Frankenstein and the ghost of Frankenstein. Yeah. And then I've seen the, the one with Robert De Niro, which is 1994 one, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You know, it'd be, it'd be good to see kind of a modern update and see people actually like it. Maybe they can make more of them. Yeah. So. Perhaps some more literature influence in this movie than some of the last ones. Yeah. And then we have a very weird movie coming out, Krampus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, German children's folklore, so Santa Claus, we obviously, if you don't know, we get from the Germans. Yeah. Santa Claus, kind of like God and the Devil, has a counterpart, and his counterpart is Krampus, who is basically the evil Santa Claus who uh, punishes children. Yep. And they are doing a horror film themed around Christmas that features Krampus or Krampus, if you will. Whatever. I mean, I've heard people say either way, but yeah, this looks like it's going to be super weird. Um, probably make a ton of money. Yeah. I'm just like, uh, man, just uh, this kind of movies just always, whenever they're that ridiculous, yeah. they just make so much money. So it's probably, I wouldn't be surprised if it turns into like a cult classic, like Sharknado or something. Oh man. That'd be so <laughs> ridiculous. And we get like a series of Krampus yep. movies. <laughs> yeah. So there's another one, which I think has already come out, but it it's called Pay the Ghost, starring Nicolas Cage, who's one of my favorite actors. He's so ridiculous. Yeah. He's amazing. You you can say that, Donnie. Yeah. <laughs> so it's about like his kid gets abducted by like a ghost or something. He has to solve a mystery about it and it looks okay. So it's called Pay the Ghost. P A Y the Ghost. I, I think they know how to say Pay the Ghost. Pay. Pay the Ghost. Give him his money. Pay the Ghost. <laughs> And one of the last ones I want to talk about, and I just I just remembered it, is uh, the Goosebumps movie coming out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with, with Jack Black. A lot of people don't like Jack Black. I actually got back into liking him again. And the reason is I saw the movie Bernie. And, yeah. Yeah, and that... And, That's actually a good movie. Right? Yeah. And so I got back into actually being like, okay, you know, he tries a lot of different things. You know, of course he does the kid movies yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. But the fact that he's kind of doing more serious roles or at least taking himself more seriously i think yeah i i really like that so I, that and what i th- will say i like about this trailer mm-hmm. is it's jack black but because he's not playing like jack, jack black. black character i didn't immediately notice it was jack black yeah so this looks really good all the characters from the goosebumps original manuscripts get like unleashed yeah i kind of i like the the plot summary for this movie you know like the Goosebumps gets unleashed in the real world, you know. Yeah, everyone is saying, you know, obviously the easiest comparison is Ghostbusters. Yeah, and that's what it looks like. I mean, honestly, it's like all oh, these monsters get unleashed. We gotta go catch them, you know. We gotta, we gotta know the way to catch them. And and I think that's cool. a good way of bringing back Goosebumps because it, it would be a little silly to just kind of like, I don't know, make an adaption of one of the books or something. Or yeah, maybe. that's basically what the show was. Yeah, that's uh pretty much Halloween for us. But the last one, it's gonna be. Crimson Peak. Yep. Guillermo del Toro. And his movies are extremely unique. Of course, he did the Hellboy movies, but that's what probably he's most famous for, I think, which yeah. is weird. But then he also did the... Was that one? The robot ones? Oh. Uh, Pacific Rim. He's kind of been moving away from his like straight-up horror roots mm-hmm. of stuff, but he you know, he did Pan's Labyrinth, which is really, really creepy. Yep. And also Mimic, which is... Well, a lot of people have a lot of issues that movie because yeah. of the content. This reminds me kind of a lot of Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing this. No, I am definitely looking forward to seeing this. Donnie and I are probably going to go watch this together. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I'm definitely looking forward to it. He just has such a unique way of doing those creepy horror moments. In fact, you know, a lot of people have been talking about uh, Baba Duke and all those new ones that are like yeah. really, really poke at you, like yeah, you know, kind of yeah. make you feel uneasy. And he definitely has that sort of thing. What I feel like this movie is really going to bring to cinema is that it's been a while since we've seen a Victorian style gothic movie kind of come into pop culture or modern movie making. Yeah. Because most of the gothic films that come out these days are kind of more along the lines of, I don't know, like a Tim Burton style something that's uh more whimsical and dreamy mm-hmm. and this really is a return to like true victorian gothic literature yeah and that's what i think a lot of people will take from it yeah that's pretty much our new segment let's get back to you yep 
Okay, so two years later, Catastrophe Ballet. Yep. One of the things I want to talk about right off the bat with this album is that it's pretty much a completely different band. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so with the first band you have, of course, Roz Williams on vocals. You have Ricky Agnew on guitars, James McGeady on bass guitar, George Belunger <laughs> on drums, and then of course you have Eva O. And then I think there was somebody else who had worked on the album too. Yeah. And this that's only Theater of Pain. Now, the only person who comes in from the next album is Roz Williams. So you, you use the first album with Valor Canned and then Gitani Demoni. I never know how to pronounce it. Demona. Yeah. Constain Smith. Man, these are like weird names. <laughs> and then David Glass and he's on drums. Now this would be the lineup for the, this album and then Ashes, which is the next album. And it is a very, very different sound than Only Theater of Pain. Well, definitely, especially because all the songs on Only Theater in Pain were written and composed by Rick Agnew and Roz Williams. Mm. Yeah, that that would make sense, especially with Rick Agnew. Well, I shouldn't say only. There's a couple of exceptions. But well, I mean, the production the was part. the production was handled by all the band to some ex- yeah. extent. But then, I mean, basically getting rid of everything for the next album is it gives it a completely different sound than only a theater of pain. And I think that that's why so many people don't tend to stray from that album. Yeah. Because man, it's just not, it's not even in the same ballpark. I mean, no, it's a very different sounding album and I'll go ahead and say it. I like this album more. Yeah. You know, I like it for different reasons. Yeah. And this is still, isn't my favorite album by then, no, at least yeah. for the Rods Williams era. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. I guess <laughs> I gives you, that. Yeah, I guess it kind of gives you an idea which one's my favorite, but <laughs> I like this album a lot, actually, and you can tell it's definitely more influenced by David Bowie and that kind of like glam rock or straightforward rock and roll mm-hmm. sort of sound a little bit more. Roz Williams is doing a little more singing, a little less poetry. Definitely. Yeah. In fact, the the singing on this is way different because yeah. with Only in Theater of Pain, he pretty much is just talk singing yeah. through most of it, and that, that's very unique in its own way, the way he does it, but in this one, he really takes a step away from that. Like I said, it, it definitely is David Bowie kind of sounding, <laughs> just because his voice is almost kind of similar like that. Like, he could do the whiny sort of thing and the deeper yeah. sort of singing. So, I think that's cool because, you know, I'm a big fan of David Bowie, and this is Christian Death sort of interpreting punk through David Bowie in a, in a strange way. Yeah. I like this better because the experimentation's w- way heavier on this one. I mean, you could say that Only Theater Pain's an entire experiment to see yeah. if a music like that can be popular. Or, you know, what you can do with punk music or... Spoken word. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But this one, I think, is just a better musically overall in terms of song structure and everything. No, and that's why I like this album a little more. Yeah. Is, um, I appreciate what they were doing with Only Theater Pain. Yeah. Well, I like Only Theater Pain because it takes risks and it's something that we haven't seen before mm-hmm. at this point in the music scene. But I like this album because I feel like there's more solid songwriting. Yeah. There's more f- solid song structure, production value. I like hearing Roz Williams sing more for the first time because he's a good singer. The one place where this suffers, obviously, is that it doesn't have that raw feel yeah. that Only Theater Pain had. It's so not if you're, quite as driving yeah, in the same sense. If you're looking for something that's way more aggressive... Yeah. And it's going to like be like that kind of like hair pulling sort of like... It's definitely moving away from super heroin sound. Yeah, definitely. In fact, this kind of comes into its own sound almost in a way where it's kind of blending that rock and roll with that death rock sort of sound. Yep. Almost like a gothic rock sort of Yeah, I would thing. almost say that this album's more... I mean, they're it's like, both death rock, but this album feels more goth than the last it's, album. It's like a blend of yeah. gothic rock and, and death rock on this one. Just because you have a lot of these songs where they maybe could have been tooled for the first album but they yeah. have these little things that make it a lot more i don't want to say mainstream or or oriented in uh, hooks if that makes sense uh, uh, i just like to talk in, about it in terms of value of songwriting ability mm-hmm. okay because it's not that these songs are more mainstream because they're not and they're definitely not picked up by the radio no, at all. no no but I would say that these songs are definitely more geared towards traditional songwriting. Mm-hmm. And I would say as far as the art of songwriting goes, yeah. these songs display them better. Yeah. So you have songs like Sleepwalk, which I would say actually if you had 
tone the production down a little bit and maybe could have been actually on only theater of pain yeah i think that that's definitely the similar kind of sound it has that kind of tinny guitar and driving drums and everything yep. and, but you know the vocals are like a new style and i do like that and then you have the blue hour it's a great song and then probably my favorite song on the whole album is this glass house oh mine's too by far i love this song <laughs> it's so good um, you ross williams singing really well yeah and the I just band like, just really feels together on that song i like the the female male vocal dynamic on yep. that too especially on this album this where they started really kind of getting into that sort of thing and i really enjoy it yeah not that it wasn't on only theater pain but you know this one i, I just really really like the way that they kind of jump between you know this glass house yeah Another thing I wanted to talk about with this one was the cover. Yeah. So, like we said... We always got to talk about album art. (laughs) Yeah. Like Robert said on about Only Theater of Pain, you know, Roz Williams had done the art for that one, and it has that kind of like crazy lettering and everything, and the the art has been remastered a whole bunch of times to make it look like cleaner and stuff. Yeah. But with Catastrophe Ballet, it has this really weird cover... I actually like this co- I, this cover a I, lot, to be honest with you. I like it a lot. Yeah. I think this is a really interesting cover. And Only Theater Pain, you know, it's cool. It does that whole... Kinda, it almost kind of looks like a super heroines cover. Well, it's almost, it has like that homemade quality to it. Yeah, yeah. Know? The DIY sort of... Yeah. It's very punk influence. But this feels to me like, like a goth album cover. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny is I guess the band didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I, I guess they didn't even work on it or anything they just kind of got the album with yeah. that album art i as like when it shipped or something that's kind of i think black sabbath same thing happened with black sabbath's first album they didn't know anything about the album art it was just yeah. like they recorded music and it's, okay that's album art i guess like, yep. and it just pick for them i think that's a pretty funny thing yeah <laughs> it's rare that sort of thing happens and it turns out well <laughs> yeah that's very true God, it's so hard to recommend the audience for this album because if you're a fan of Christian Death, then chances are you're a big fan of Only Theater of Pain, and mm-hmm. this is definitely a departure from that. Yeah, that's that's kind of one of the issues I, I run into recommending this album, because I know so many people are into Only Theater of Pain, and that's like the album for them. You know, yeah. I, Actually, I know a lot of people who that's the only yeah. album of Christian Death they've listened to. And it depends, of course, where you are and where their singles were bigger or which albums were bigger. But definitely in you know an LA kind of California yeah. scene, that's the only album I see people posting songs from. Yeah, in California yeah. at the time, I mean the hardcore punk scene is very big, so yeah. I think the goth scene is getting very influenced by that mm-hmm. out here. So I think that's why death rock took off more in LA than goth yeah. music necessarily. And that's probably the remnants of that. You yeah, know, like people are into the LA leather punk scene and stuff, yep. and it's like, oh, like this is kind of like something I can relate to. Yeah. Um, I think this album is definitely, definitely worth people's time. Oh, I think so. It's just go into it expecting something different. You yeah. got to have an open mind about this album. Yeah. And since you probably already had an open mind about Christian Death, listening yeah. to Only Your Pain, <laughs> I think you just need to kind of go in this thing that's a little bit more straightforward kind of album. Yeah. So that's Catastrophe Ballet. Yep. Okay, we're going one year later. Yep. It's going to be 1985. And we've got the release of Ashes, which is... Roz Williams' last album with Christian Death. Yep. It's definitely not the last album he would do. I yeah. Mean, he has a ton of other work, which we'll probably talk about later. Same lineup as uh, the last album. Yeah. That's actually why these albums at least sound kind of similar. Catastrophe yeah. Ballet and Ashes have some resemblance, at least. Yeah. You kind of see... Well, I feel like Catastrophe Ballet starts this trajectory that they're going towards, and Ashes is definitely the arrival of that. Yeah. What's really weird is I feel like a ton of people have not heard this album. Oh, definitely not. Now, I I have met people who have heard Catastrophe Ballet and like it. Yeah. Right? Well, that's I see that in record stores enough that people will buy it and like I have definitely heard people who like Only Theater of Pain. Yep. I mean, ton ton of people just you just say that and they just know who like oh Christian Death Album. Yep. Now, Ashes. I have rarely ever met anybody who's... It's kind of like this Black Sheep album for them. Yeah, it is. And I'm not surprised that it is. Yeah. Well, if you're a Christian Death fan, this is a major departure from their sound. Yeah. And it hardly bears a resemblance to this stuff. In fact, the vocals on this album, Roz definitely developed a very Bowie-esque vocal delivery Mm -hmm. by this point. So... 
he was kind of hinting at it with Catastrophe Ballet. Yeah. Especially with what he was going for. He's kind of going for that little bit deeper sound. and It kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the early Peter Murphy stuff. Kind of, yeah. Sort of. I just mean the vocal delivery. Oh, okay, Not, yeah. not okay, the yeah. instrumentation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. But this album it is experimental for them Yeah. by a long shot. It is way more melodic. It, it uses soundscape a, mm-hmm. a lot on this album. Now, with Catastrophe of Ballet... There's there's pretty much none of that. Well, no, no, there is. Yeah, uh, the, there is like the what's it? The last it's experimentation. There's like well, the last track is just a soundscape track on Catastrophe Ballet. Yeah, but it's not it's not what you think of when you think of a soundscape track. Well, experimenting. Yeah, there's, well, yeah, there's hardly <laughs> any music in that track. It's just a, a noise or something. Yeah, I, I guess I could see what you're saying. But for this one, they actually incorporated in the songs. Yeah, kind of do their own thing. So. They were basically taking everything they were doing on Catastrophe Ballet and then push it way farther. Yeah. Now, you have this precedent right when you open up with the song Ashes, which is a great, great it's song. One of the best songs on the record. Yeah. And it's like seven minutes long. So you yep. have this very, like, you know, a lot of goth fans are following that yeah. sort of thing. So I had this really long openers. But then you just have this very, I don't want to say uneven because it's a very good album. Yeah. But very strange songs like you, there's no real consistency to this album no they're definitely trying very different things on every song production wise arrangement wise yeah they're going for a real diversity on this album yeah it, it still definitely has the the kind of like valor can christian death sort of guitar sound yeah to an extent but they have filled it out a little more yeah you have these really, really strong songs with actually some pretty catchy parts. I mean, When I Was Bed, mm-hmm. that song is awesome. Yeah. And it's totally catchy, and I'd get it stuck in my head. And <laughs> you have what's probably the weirdest song on the album, which is Lament Over the Shadows. Yeah. Now, I don't know what is up with this song. <laughs> it sounds like something out of like a silent movie soundtrack or yeah, something like that, you know? It's carnival kind of. Was, um, who's that director? Like the guy who directed Amelie and uh, it's Lost City of Children. It's um, Jean Pierre yeah. Renault or whatever. Or Junot or. Um, yeah, so it sounds like something out of one of his movies. You know, it sounds it's very like. La, da, very da, whimsical. Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, and it's so good. I love it. I love that song so much. I think personally, I love that song and love most of the songs on this album yeah. ashes is still for me that song yeah it really does it for me on this album yeah the other one i really like it's it's almost hard not to say i don't you know i like the whole album it's yeah just, but if you want the if you want my favorite songs in the album is gonna be ashes which actually maybe what, seek out this album yeah, yeah. Same. and then uh when i was bed lament over the shadows and face and that's pretty much like half the album but, yeah <laughs> but it's just that good and i i just really like this one because it was years. Like, I'd already known Christian Death for years before yeah. I heard this one. I even heard some of the Valor Can stuff. And then when I heard Ashes, I was just really surprised. Mm-hmm. And it's totally the, like, there's not much information about it out there. And I think that it's just because, I don't know, maybe legal issues or something. Maybe. And I feel like it may have something to do with Ross Williams' departure right after this album. Yeah, same and year. Yeah. Um, but I, I really enjoy it. Hey, I'm going to come out and say it. Right. It's hard for me to say this because I know if you're a Christian Death fan, you're probably a big fan of Only Theater of Pain and maybe a fan of Catastrophe Ballet. But as far as these three records go, this is my favorite, and this is the one that I highly recommend you check out. You know what is crazy? I'm, I don't know if we're going to make people angry or not, but this is actually this was my favorite too. Yeah. In fact, I actually really, really connect with this album, and it's, it's really strange. But I think that the uniqueness of this album, you just hardly will hear anything else like this. Only Theater of Pain is unique in a very good way, right? Yeah. But a lot of bands have mimicked that sound. Yep. And that's not that doesn't detract from Only Theater of Pain. In fact, it's you know classic, and that is so influential, right? Yeah. And Catastrophe Ballet did something a little different, and some people connect to it in the same way. It's not as popular. Yeah. But it's still really good. It's still definitely has that kind of consistency. You know, all these albums feature like clean guitars to some extent, but they kind of used it more heavily and we're kind of mixing with melody a little more later on. But with Ashes, I mean, there's honestly, I can't even think of an album other than maybe like it's some David Bowie music where just it's just so experimental and very, very unique. Yeah. 
and it really works. And although every song on this album is very different, it really doesn't bring across the feeling of consistency. Yeah, and I really agree with that, which is so strange because, like we said, if you wouldn't ever listen to Ashes, every single song is really different. Yeah. And some of it, obviously, like this song's face and um, When I Was Bad, they obviously sound similar to things like Catastrophe Ballet yeah. or anything like that because it's the same band mm-hmm. and they are very tight. But just the use of keyboards and the not constraining themselves to yeah. a, a specific sound it just really works well and i really do think that and i may, may i gotta choose my words wisely here because uh-huh. i may be crucified by christian death fans for saying this and crucified by christian yep. death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but i really think that this band benefited from that lineup change at the second album Ooh, that is some fine words i and I love super heroines and I love that kind of sound and I love catastrophe ballet, but I really think that in order for this band to grow, they need that lineup change. I think the Valor can brought a really important dynamic to the band as well as their keyboard player. And it really allowed for them to experiment and try new things and to push the band in new directions that they wouldn't have gone with otherwise. I, it's hard to say because, you know, they obviously Christian uh, Death. Yeah, there's that's the only album. I mean, <laughs> Shadow Project with Roz Williams is different than Christian Death. It, it Of course, it does bear Roz Williams' signatures. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I can see that. You know, that this that because of the lineup changes, we ended up with this really, really good, strong album that's extremely different than just two albums before. I mean, it's 1982 to 1985. Yeah. Now, in music time, that's a, this is a huge, huge amount of time for a band I mean, I know it's... At least in the 80s it was. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? But it's a classic to me. Like, it's totally like a classic sounding album to me, which is yeah. really strange because... Because it's not in real yeah. life. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like it's very underrated. A lot of people haven't heard of it. Yeah. I In fact, if you feel like, oh yeah, what's your favorite Christian Death Line? It's like, oh, Romeo's Distress. Or, yeah. or basically anything off of Only Theater Pain. Or, and it's virtually impossible to pull up any history on this album. You have to dig so deep to find anything about this album. Yeah, well, to find any facts about something, you can find the like, lineup and stuff, but going any farther than that, you have to either look at like reviews from the time yep. or any kind of interviews. So, yeah, I could see why there's not that much to access about it, and especially if they didn't tour that much on it. Yeah. So, And sometimes I wonder, maybe Catastrophe Ballet and especially Ashes might have been more popular had there been more information released about them, had they been promoted more. Or video or something. Yeah, well, because... Only Theater Pain mm-hmm. is definitely the most promoted Roz Williams album with this yeah. band. And it's in every record store that has a goss section. You'll find mm-hmm. that album. Yeah. And so I think it's easily accessible. And I think that's why people gravitate towards it. I mean, people gravitate towards it because it's a good album. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of interesting ideas that are introduced by this band. But it's so accessible compared to these next two albums that come in terms of availability yeah i could see that and especially because of the fact that it has the crossover kind of with punk i think it's a very easy jumping off point for people even though it's very abrasive because all these albums are abrasive in their own way ash is probably probably the least so yeah that way well it's almost more abrasive in the sense that it's just a departure from what they've been doing yeah so if you're saying yeah yeah, the first album that you heard yeah because catastrophe ballet still definitely has that tinge of kind of rawness to it less mm-hmm. so definitely less so than only theater pain yeah and then ashes it, this is a whole nother beast. it just does not even <laughs> resemble that yeah. you know it resembles catastrophe ballet to some extent but definitely doesn't sound like the same band that was only theater pain and it's not to it's, be yeah, fair. Well, yeah it is <laughs> that's, that's a good point but i'd say definitely give ashes a chance if yeah. you've never heard it i still of course wholeheartedly recommend all these albums because Roz williams was a really really talented guy yeah you know and he did his own thing and that's what you know people gravitate towards that it's unique yeah it and, really brought on the death rock scene yeah and it's very tragic of course you know what happened and you know we'll talk about that probably now so we don't want to talk about that in depth with you know the music we want you guys to focus on what was great about this yeah and i would say give them all a chance if you're more into like Bauhaus kind of music i would say actually listen to ashes first yeah if you're much more into Something like Super Heroines or even like In the Flat Field. I mean, if that's your favorite Bowser record, I mean, you can probably listen to Only Theater of Pain. Yeah, I was like going to say, uh, and this is funny because I don't 
care for the later Bauhaus records as much. I mean, we talked about this yeah, already. Yeah, I know, yeah. But uh, I like Ashes much more, and that definitely resembles the later Bauhaus records more than yeah. it does so the early ones. That's weird. But yeah. we also addressed that the reason I didn't like those albums is because I didn't feel like they sounded like Bauhaus. Just listen to the, <laughs> just listen to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> so I recommend all these three albums wholeheartedly. In fact, I don't think there's a bad album in the bunch of them. Yeah. Like we said, even when we were doing The Cure, we thought Top was extremely spotty. None of these albums are really that spotty. Yeah. And they're all kind of have a vision behind them. And that's what I think makes them very classic. So go out there, listen to them. Go, go, go Christian Death people. Yes. Go uh, find yourself a copy of Ashes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, another thing I want to talk about with that is there's a lot of different versions of the cover of this album. Yeah. And it, I don't know what the album is supposed to be. Yeah. Because I, I've i seen ones where the original release is like this kind of Dracula vamp, vampire guy and he has like a sort of like Vincent Price looking face. Right? I, li- I like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm, I'm um, going with that's what it should be. <laughs> so that, that I've seen that cover and that's a pretty common one. Then I've seen the one where it looks like the same cover but it looks like more of a, a gothic kind of face on it and yeah. has like the you know, big teased hair and everything which I think was for the reissues. Yeah. It, but I think it's only specific countries. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's, we've seen it, which is the vinyl reissue, which has the like white cover and it has like this Greek painting on it. Yep. And so there's a whole bunch of different versions of this album, which I think only leads to more confusion. And of course they've changed the covers with, um, like when they did only theater paint reissues, they have the same album art, but it's like they changed the cover to like a, burnt paper kind of look yeah, and then it's, they, it's kind of like a brownish yeah and they have like the black outlines of the classic black and yellow yep so with ashes there's a whole bunch of different kinds of things so if you're really confused and you're like uh you know going out to buy some vinyl or something like that or you're gonna buy the cd just make sure it has the the same track listing as the standard just look for the words ashes <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> yeah so that's all i'd say about ashes and kind of what i wanted to say about each of these albums and i just want to reiterate like just give ashes a chance (laughs) (laughs) okay yeah if you listen to this podcast you probably have heard only theater pain a million times and maybe catastrophe ballet (laughs) maybe yeah maybe catastrophe ballet so thank you for listening to this episode if you guys want to contact us you have any questions comments anything at all you can reach us at gothcastradio at gmail.com you can also contact us via facebook or our instagram Again, you could just search Gothcast to find those things. And if you like this episode, please subscribe either via our website or iTunes or whatever your personal method of using podcasts is. You can find us on there. Yeah. iTunes reviews. I always like reading the reviews because like I mentioned in previous episodes, Robert is really more the online sort of thing for the podcast and most stuff. So whenever I go on there, I'm just like checking to see if somebody... Let's just like comment or review or something like that. Yeah. So, well, if you go on our website, yeah, definitely feel free to leave comments on, you know, especially the podcast posts. I mean, we'd like to hear what you guys think about what we're doing. We'd like to know what you guys would like to see in the future. Yeah, especially with Christian Death is a very good question because we're going to keep continue doing the Cure pretty much all the way up until their new stuff. But with Christian Death, I would like to know if there's actually a desire for us to talk about the Valor Canned albums. And- yeah, because there is a ton of music to talk about but I'm not sure people would necessarily be as into it as say they would the Roz Williams era so yeah. so if you guys are interested then just let us know alright alright this concludes Gothcast alright episode 6 yep bye bye